I'm about to study the incorruptible, inerrant Word of God. I open my heart to God's message. I humble my mind to His wisdom, and I rest my hopes on His grace. I will accept His rebukes with repentance, rejoice in His truth by faith, and trust in His promises that can never fail. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I can change what it says I can change as I trust in His grace and Spirit. I covenant with God that I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to change as I hide His Word in my heart and honor Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Now, I asked the first service this morning because they were doing a good job saying that declaration. We've been saying this for many years, and many of you have been coming here for many years. How many of you think you could say that without having to look at the screen? Oh, my. Yeah, it looks like a great number of you. It's a little secret for you to understand. You've said this once a week for probably many, many years. It's the same way in your Bible memorization. Pick a passage of Scripture, read it out loud for two weeks every morning. You'll be shocked that you'll probably be able to quote it at the end of two weeks. Very simple. Bible memorization isn't that hard. Just read your Bible out loud because you have to read it with your eyes, you have to process it with your mouth, and you get to hear yourself say it. And when you do it that way, it's amazing how you can hide God's Word in your heart. So just a little, that was free. I'm not even going to charge you for that this morning, all right? Okay, our children can be dismissed, and our discipleship class. Yes. Let me just mention this before we start our study this morning. Um, we are going to have an all church picnic on March the 24th, and Pastor Merritt misled me this morning. He wrote down April 24th, and then he corrected himself from the back. But anyway, it's March the 24th. We're going on Palm Sunday, so that's just a couple of weeks away. We're going to be having uh, an all church picnic. Everybody is invited. Don't bring a thing. All the food will be provided. So just bring you and yourselves and your appetite, okay? And there is no agenda other than us just getting together, fellowshipping, and uh, enjoying each other and enjoying some good food. And God's people know how to do that, right? Amen. Yeah, I heard some good amens on that one. Okay. So remember that. Put that on your calendar and uh, be ready. It'll happen right after this second service uh, on March the 24th on Palm Sunday. And we'll have... Uh, the whole atrium area and some, several other areas set up to accommodate because many of the first service people will be coming back for that as well. Okay, this morning we're going to continue with message number seven on the future looking through God's open door. As I said, what we're going to be looking at this morning is an event that is so catastrophic and so incredible that it will change all time and all eternity forever. Your life will never be the same after this moment and uh, that we're going to be looking at, and no one's life will ever be the same. The question is going to be, what will be the difference? Will that difference be that you are rejoicing with Christ because of his salvation and because you have received what he did for you in dying for your sins and making it possible for you to be reconciled to God and live with him forever because that's what he wants for you? Or will you be those who have rejected him and, re and uh, neglected him and therefore have to receive justice some other way, which is not what God wants, but is what many people will encounter? So we come now in our study to the sixth seal of the seven which the Lamb opens in the scroll of destiny. Scroll of Destiny is the term I'm using to refer to that scroll that was in the right hand of God the Father on the throne, in his right hand of power and justice, which no one was allowed to open unless they were worthy to answer every objection of evil and to bring God's justice upon the earth. And we found that the Lamb was found worthy to unseal this scroll and unleash God's final judgments on the unrepentant and... Uh, and to bring evil to an end, and to ultimately unleash his plan for the fulfillment of all of his promises for his redeemed children. So let's turn to our study passage this morning, 
and look at how Christ opens this sixth seal. And then we're going to do some comparisons with this because we're going to be able to learn about when this happens in sequence because we have some other passages of Scripture that will teach us that. And we're going to be able to see when this incredible day is going to happen, at least in regard to the order of events, not necessarily in regard to the day or the hour, although we will be able to see um, that we can see the seasons very closely. But let's look at this very quickly as we look at Revelation 6, 12 through 17. Then I watched as the Lamb opened the sixth seal. There was a great, powerful earthquake. That's exactly what the, the word here in the Greek means. It's a mega earthquake. The sun turned black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon turned as red as blood. And the meteors of the heaven fell to the earth. And I have a little asterisk there for you. It's just simply that all the Greek scholars make it clear that the word astara here in the Greek literally refers to uh, what would be an illumination falling, as we would call it, a falling star, like an asteroid, a meteor, or a comet. And so uh, we're not talking about, you know, uh, you know, some big star falling to the earth. The earth couldn't survive that. That's not what's being described. We're talking about asteroids and those kinds of things. And everything in the, the heavens that, except for the sun and the moon, that was shining was called, referred to as a star. And uh, But in this case, it would be referred to as an asteroid that fell to the earth. And of course, that could be very devastating because we know asteroids, if they're very large, can create um, very uh, catastrophic events. It says that these meteors... Uh, of the heavens fell to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Um, the sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Doesn't mean that it ceased to be, but it was removed to a different place. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, uh, the princes, the important people is what that means. The generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They cried to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to withstand it. This is what we might call a reality check for the world. The world has been denying Christ. The world has been rejecting God. The world has been saying we don't, we're not accountable to him. We don't have to answer to him. We can forget about him. We can go about our own way and do our own thing. But on this moment, everyone's going to realize that is a lie because the creator of the universe in whose hands is our very life and our very breath. He's created us and he sustains us. At that moment, is going to come to exert his sovereignty over the universe and over his creations, which is us, and we will all answer to him. And here, those who have rejected him, who have not turned to him, are finding that in this moment they're facing a terrible event because they cannot escape these judgments that come with the one sitting on the throne, who is the Lamb, who is coming with his wrath. Now, this may create a little bit of a needed expansion in your understanding this morning, as we often only think of the Lamb in some of his roles as Messiah. But remember, the Bible depicts him in several other roles, and we'll be discussing that as we go through. It is clear this is, this is a description of what is termed elsewhere in Scripture as Christ epiphania. Uh, there is an English word which we get from epiphania. It's epiphany. And many of you may have heard uh, that word many times. It's used in many churches to refer to a festival of the church. Uh, it's a Greek word which means an appearance or manifestation of a divine being. And so we often hear this word used as a title for a church festival, such as a festival um, when the wise men came and they discovered the Christ child is considered the epiphany or the manifestation 
of the Messiah to the Gentiles because they represented Gentiles in most people's thinking, although it's very possibly that they were Jews of the diaspora. But then also the Eastern Church commemorates an epiphany of Christ uh, at his baptism because they said they believe that at his baptism, Jesus was revealed to Israel as their Messiah and the Son of God because God the Father spoke audibly from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so at that moment, he was revealed. He was manifested. It was an epiphany. He came to be known. In reference to Christ's second coming, the Apostle Paul uses this word, this epiphanias, uh, together with another word, which is parousia, and parousia, which just simply means visible presence, uh, noting an arrival and a consequence perceived presence at the place you arrive at. So the Apostle Paul says, for example, that Christ will overthrow the lawless one, talking about the Antichrist, this is in 2 Corinthians, uh, with the breath of his mouth, which means his words, and destroy him by the splendor, the epiphania, of his parousia, his presence, his appearing. And so Paul here is equating this outshining of Christ, this appearance of Christ, and this presence of Christ as something that will be the end of evil. So notice there are two things that are depicted by these words. First of all, his arrival is a bright, visible, shining event, which will be visible to everyone. It's not going to be some secret nighttime, everybody got raptured, and then everybody wakes up and went, what happened? Where did everybody go? No, that's not taught in the Bible anywhere. His arrival is bright, it's visible, it's shining event, and it will be visible to all as we're going to see as we walk through the scriptures. And then secondly, it will result in his visible presence with his saints and his visible presence here on earth as king. When Jesus comes back in the same manner as the apostles saw him going to heaven from the Mount of Olives, it says he's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives and he is going to be king and he's going to set up the, his earthly kingdom, which will last for a thousand years before he finally destroys the new, this present heaven and earth and replaces it with the new heaven and earth. Now, as the Apostle Paul pointed out, his presence will be destructive to the Antichrist and his followers and to all who do evil. Understand, Christ wants everyone to be saved, but the Bible makes it very clear not everyone is willing to be saved. So at some point, there has to be a period. At some point, God says, enough. Everyone's been provided for. Everyone has had an opportunity, but they've turned their backs. And now, for those who have not accepted my solution, there will be justice, because all of us deserve justice, but none of us really want justice. We want grace. We want mercy. And that's what God wants us to get. But it depends upon how we respond to his offer to us. It is very important to take notice that this word parousia that Paul uses is used by Paul to describe the rapture of the church. And some people who don't read the original language don't understand this. This parousia, this appearance, this this, uh, presence of Christ is described as something that will happen at the rapture. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17 and uh, look at what... It said here, it says, according to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left to the coming are the appearing, the parousian is the Greek word here. And by the way, someone had asked me in the first service afterwards, and I just let me make this clear. In verses 13 and 14, Paul is talking about those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, who have died already. And he says, don't worry about those. We don't, we don't grieve like those who have no hope because we believe that Christ will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him. In other words, they're with him right now in their spirit body, but they're going to come back with him, and then they're going to be resurrected and take on their immortal fleshly body as well and then rise to meet him as completed resurrected souls. And so keep that in mind, and that's what he's talking about. And so he says here, he says that who are left till the coming, the appearing, the parousion of the Lord will certainly 
not perceive those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. So don't worry about those who have died because God has a plan for them to include them. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet. And pantason is the Greek, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, the Apostle Paul is describing what every Christian recognizes as the rapture or the gathering of God's people to Christ when he appears in his parousian, where his epiphania, where he is his outshining, where the whole world is going to see him. And the the word uh, that is used here for the term to meet, and pantasin, uh, means to go out to meet, celebrate, and then escort back to where you came from. Now, I've shared this a couple of times, but let me just remind you. This is used in Greek literature. We find it all through Greek literature and in Roman literature, where a dignitary of some kind is coming to a city. And when a Caesar, for example, came to a city, they got a lot of notice. You know why? Because they had to they had to make the place shine. It would be what my mother called a spit shine. That's what she did to us three boys when she, we came in from playing and she wanted to clean us up to go somewhere. She, she, it was a spit shine, especially if there was not much time. And you know what that included? It included some of mom's uh, quick spit shines, okay? But the point is she's cleaning us boys up. But you, you had to clean the village up. You had to clean the town up. You had to get it ready. It had to look immaculate for this important dignitary. And it's a good way of saying to us, we need to be sure our souls are ready for Christ to come. We need to be sure that we're ready to greet him and that we have a holy and righteous heart full of love for him. But when the time came for that visit, on that day, they would put people out a few miles from the city. They would see the Caesar or the dignitaries procession coming. They would ride back and tell the people in the city, and there would be this great parade of people that would go out to meet the Caesar. They would stop there in the middle of the road. There would be gifts and uh, welcomes and speeches. You know, a politician would never pass up an opportunity to give a speech, right? And so they'd give speeches, and then they would welcome the Caesar, and then they would escort him back to the city, and then his real visit would commence. Now, Jesus is, and the, the New Testament uses this word many times. In fact, in Acts 28, 15, the Apostle Paul, you remember, had been in prison for five years. He finally appeals to Caesar. He's being taken to Rome. He has a long, difficult journey. And you'll recall that he even gets a shipwreck in the process of getting to Rome. But finally, the Roman Christians who have read his letter to them, which is our epistle to the Romans and the New Testament, which was an absolute masterpiece of revelation in regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they have come to greatly admire the Apostle Paul and desire to meet him because he is an apostle who has tremendous insight into the atonement and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When they hear that he's coming, it says they heard that Paul was on his way. It says that a delegation from the church of Christians went out of Rome to a place called the Three Taverns. So I assume there must have been three taverns there, because that's what, what the Gangster section was named. But they went out to a place called the Three Taverns, and there they met Paul, and they greeted him and welcomed him to the church. And they helped escort him back, even though he was under uh, Roman soldier uh, supervision, they nonetheless wanted to greet him because he was an important and a, a honored guest for the church to receive. So they, they went out to greet him and bring him back. And this is the word that is used. They went out to anpantasen him, to bring him into the city. So this is the meaning of this word every place we see it in ancient literature. 
Now, Jesus uses this word in comparison to his second coming to that of a bride showing up to get his bride. You may recall the Olivet Discourse not only is in the 24th chapter of Matthew, it bleeds over into the fullness of chapter 25. And you recall that Jesus begins that part of the Olivet Discourse with this statement, then, or tata, because it's a sequence thing, then the kingdom of heaven is going to be like a bridegroom, or, or like ten virgins, I should say, who went out and trimmed their lamps to get ready for the bridegroom's arrival. And you remember that it says they all got sleepy, uh, they all went to sleep, that there were five that were wise enough to bring extra oil, there were five who were not. But the point is, is that when the cry rang out, and remembered a Jewish wedding at this period of time, uh, the bridegroom would tell them approximately when he was coming, but he never told them the exact day or hour. It was just within this time period. And when, and they usually picked nighttime because they wanted torches and lights and all that kind of thing, because it would make it more festive. And so when at night, it says at midnight, the cry rang out, the bridegroom is here. The bridegroom is here. The virgins get up, they've been asleep, but they trimmed their lamps. The ones who didn't have enough oil had to run to try to find some. But you remember the others go out to and pantasin him, to meet him. They would take the bride with them. They would take the bride's family with them. They would meet him. There would be a greeting. There would be a welcome of the bridegroom because there is now there has been a covenant between them for probably a year. And then they would escort the bridegroom back to the bride's house where the first part of the wedding uh, celebration would begin. So Jesus said at the end of the age, my kingdom and how it comes will be like this Hebrew wedding. It will be in the same way, and the, we, are, we, the bride, are going to rise to meet him, greet him, celebrate him, and escort him back to set up his kingdom. Now, let's compare Scripture with Scripture. We have learned in this series that one of the best ways to understand Scripture is to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And when we do that, we suddenly begin to have further light and understanding on what a passage is saying. And so we're going to talk about comparing Scripture with Scripture for a moment. It is of great importance in comparing Scripture to Scripture that we take note that what Paul described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17, which I just read you a few moments ago about the rapture of the church, is, ex is exactly the same event which is described in Matthew 24, 30-31. And I'm going to show you that those are exactly the same in just a moment. This is of major importance because I have taught on many occasions, if you've been around the church very long, that the Olivet Discourse, when read in the original language the Bible was written in, the, uh, the Koine Greek, is that it is a time sequence calendar. And what we mean by that is that Jesus takes the major events of end time, not all the events, because you can take this sequence calendar, which is kind of like a skeleton, which Jesus lays out, and you can go to other places in the Bible and get a lot more, say, say to, so to speak, meat and flesh put on that event so that you know a little bit more about it. Daniel can give you more information sometimes. Sometimes Paul gives you more information. Sometimes John does that. But the whole point is, is that Jesus, as the authority, gives us the sequence and says, this is the order in which it's going to happen. And here are the key events, and they will happen exactly in this order because he uses time sequence language. The key word he uses, although he uses other phrases, is the word tata, which means then or at that time. So it's a sequence word, which means this happens, then, and only then, can this happen, and then, then, at that time, this will happen. So we are going to see that Jesus is going to talk about this same event we just read about in, uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. And it's interesting that as Jesus talks about this sequencing of events, in Luke's record of this, he points to the fact and makes, actually says this. He says that when you begin to see all these things happening, in order, in other words, they're unfolding and you're starting to see them happen. You see the sequence being fulfilled. He says, then... Look up, for your redemption is near. 
Now, what does that mean? How could you look up unless you could see those events, read the signs of the time, and know that it's about to happen? So obviously, we're not going to be in the dark about when it's about to happen. We won't know the exact day. We won't know the exact hour. That would be heretical to claim because Jesus said you can't. But we're not supposed to be in darkness either. Paul said to the Thessalonians in chapter 5, after he had talked about the rapture, he said, brothers and sisters, you know that that day, uh, our gathering to Christ, he says, concerning our gathering, you know that day is going to come like a thief in the night for those who are in darkness. A lot of people stop there and say, see, we can't know anything about it. It's going to be like a thief in the night. And Jesus said, and Paul goes on and says, no, 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 it's for those who are in darkness. Then verse 3 says, but that day should not surprise you like a thief, because you're children of the light and children of the day. And then he tells them, don't be asleep, but be awake, be alert, pay attention. That's what Jesus said to us, watch so that you will not be taken by surprise. And it will be like the days of Noah. Did Noah and his family know when to enter the ark? Yes. They knew when to, did they know when the flood was exactly coming? No. They entered it, God sealed it, and then seven days later, the flood came. So the point is, they knew, God said, get in there, I'm going to seal you in, and we're going to know when God says, the time is now. So we need to know that we can know the seasons. So the reason we can know that is because we have the illumination, the light, we're children of light, of the Word of God, and we have the illumination of the Holy Spirit so that we will be aware. There are several key elements listed in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17, which we read a few moments ago, and all believers recognize this passage as describing the rapture of the church, and it's an exciting moment for us. We're looking forward to that. These key elements are these, and let me just list them on the screen for you real quickly. Here are the key things that happen that allow you to compare this passage with any other passage that's describing the same event. So look at it. It says, first of all, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. So this is not just going to be God sending some angel to do something. Jesus himself is going to come down from heaven. Then it says, with a loud command, the voice of the archangel. So we know angels are present, and there's a command that's going to be given. Okay? And it says, and the trumpet call of God. So trumpets involved. And that's mentioned many places in Scripture. Paul says that when this happens, that the dead in Christ are going to rise at the last trumpet, and those of us who are alive and remain are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then we're all going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Corinthians 15. And so this, there's going to be a trumpet call. It'll be at the last trumpet. The dead are raised. Paul describes that. The dead are raised first, and then for a few seconds, so to speak, they're in their immortal bodies. The ones who are alive are transformed and metamorphosized into immortal bodies. And for a few moments, all the saints of the ages are standing on planet Earth, and then, boom, we are caught up, gathered to be with the Lord. And then uh, it says there are clouds. Now, this is interesting. Almost in every passage, you get this word, these words clouds are present at the coming of Christ. This is important because the New Testament wants us to understand that this is something that was prophesied by the prophet Daniel in Daniel 7. Do you remember Jesus' favorite term for himself while he walked the earth? His favorite term, he didn't call himself the Son of God, although he did confess that he was the Son of God. But his favorite term for himself was Son of Man. And many people read that and think, oh, well, Jesus was being so humble. He should have said, I'm the Son of God, you know, because, you know, that's who he was. But he's just being so humble and saying, I'm just the Son of Man. No, 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 no. That was an exalted title. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel, in a vision, sees the end of days, and he sees God sitting on his throne. And he said, I saw one like a Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he was escorted into the presence of the Ancient of Days, and he was given dominion and authority over all, and all nations will worship him. So he's deity, he's being worshipped. And Jesus always claimed to be that Son of Man who will come on the clouds of the sky. In fact, 
you remember he's standing before Caiaphas when they arrest him. And Caiaphas is getting frustrated because none of the witnesses can agree about anything because they're trying to find witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. And finally, Caiaphas just says, look, I charge you by the Most High. Tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? And Jesus said, you're right in saying that I am. And then he added something. He quoted Daniel 7. And in the future, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And when he said that, Caiaphas, who did not want to accept that Jesus was the Messiah, ripped his robes as a sign of horror and said, blasphemy, blasphemy. What more do we need? We've heard the blasphemy from his own mouth. And they then condemned him to death. In other words, Jesus was crucified for confessing the truth about who he was. Isn't that interesting? He he tells the truth and he gets crucified for it. But that was God's plan. So he is the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. And you can see that in this passage. And then it says, all rise to meet him. Again, ampantasin, which means to meet him, celebrate with him. That will probably take many days. A lot of people think of the coming of the rapture as just a one-day event or a one-moment event. It's going to take many days. I could take you to places in Scripture to show that. Don't have time this morning. But the point is, is that eventually we will return with him to set up his kingdom. Now, let's look at the Matthew passage that is identical to this passage. A little bit different wording, but the same exact events are in it as we read it in the Olivet Discourse. And here's the advantage. If we read it in the Olivet Discourse, we know where it is in the sequence. Because Jesus is telling us this will happen, then this will happen, and then immediately after those days, this will happen, and so on. So we know exactly what season in which this will happen. So let's read this passage. He says, At that time, tata, again, is the Greek word, is what it starts with. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. So that's a very visible place, right? And all the nations of the earth will mourn. How many nations? All. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So it doesn't sound like this is a very secret kidnapping, does it? And he will send his angels, which implies a command is given. He's going to send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect, that's the church, his believers, his followers, from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now, remember I gave you a list of the key things happening in First Thessalonians four, fifteen through 17, which we know is describing the rapture. Let's look at this list here, which will take a couple of screens to get in, because I added a little bit more material to it. But first of all, Jesus himself appears in heaven, just like in First Thessalonians. He's in the sky. He is visible to the whole world, which Jesus makes clear to us. The nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming. So this is not something that people are going to be able to avoid. Remember Jesus describing his coming. He said, if somebody tells you that the Son of Man is coming secretly, he's over here in the room somewhere, or he's out in the desert somewhere, he said, don't go. That's not true. He said, when I come, nobody's going to miss it. It's going to be like lightning starting in the east and going across the whole sky to the west. Nobody's going to be able to miss that because it's going to be a lightning flash that covers the whole of the sky. Very visible is what he's saying. So he says, all the nations are going to see it. They're going to mourn. And then he says, a command. In other words, angels are sent. He's going to send his angels. That's a command. And he will send his angels. Then a loud trumpet call with a loud trumpet call in this passage is a statement. So we see those trumpets just like in Thessalonians. And then it says, the gathering of the lack will happen. And perhaps a majority of, of, whom, of the elect of whom are there in their graves must obviously include a resurrection, as Paul describes, and the transformation of the alive, and they will be gathered, his elect. So if the elect are dead, they're going to be resurrected. If the elect are alive, they're going to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. And then they will all be caught up together to meet and pantasen the Lord in the air. 
And so we have uh, th that same event is there. So it's describing the rapture. By the way, the word rapture is not a biblical term, so you won't find it anywhere in the Bible. It's a theological term, which we use to describe a biblical event, because the biblical event is the gathering and the catching away of God's people, and the English word rapture describes that kind of event. And so we are raptured to him, or gathered to him is the meaning. And here in this passage, the word gathered is actually used. And then these still alive, of course, are transformed, for they have to be to be able to be gathered as his elect. And then we have, there are clouds again. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. And all the elect are gathered from all over the world and rise to Christ in the clouds and the air. And notice that it has these words, and they, the angels, will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And I've given you this little notation on the screen. This last statement is a very comprehensive statement, meaning there's not one place on earth where the elect are not gathered from. So God's not going to overlook anybody. It doesn't matter where, you know, you may have died at sea and they may have dumped your body at sea and you may be 10,000 feet down in the ocean. It doesn't matter. He's going to gather you to himself. He's going to see to it that you are part of that gathering. So it says no place on planet earth to the four winds of the heaven, to every corner of the earth, he is going to see to it that his elect are gathered to him. They are his possession. Any attempt, now, let me say this. I know that most of you have heard all of your lives. And by the way, many people who are going to be in heaven with us believe this, and that's fine. We all, in, the, in our church, we do not say that you must believe a certain theory of how Jesus is going to do it. You just have to believe he's going to do it. You got to believe he's coming, right? If you believe he's coming, welcome, brother, sister, because you're a true believer, okay? And you say, well, I think it's a little different than this. That's fine. We can have wonderful discussions about it, okay? Just get your Bible out, and we'll start working our way through it. And that's what we're doing this morning, is we're just working our way through and letting Scripture compare with Scripture. But the point is this, is that most of us have been taught that the coming of Christ is a phased coming, that there's like a second and third coming. He came the first time, but later he's going to come a second time, and then he's going to go back to heaven for like seven years, and then he's going to come a second time. Well, the Bible doesn't know anything about that. You can't find a single verse in Scripture that mentions that. In fact, you can find a lot of verses that make it clear that's not true, some of those which we're studying this morning, that his coming is one great event which will cover a period of time, not just a single day, and that that great event is going to be very visible to the whole world, and every eye shall see him, every eye shall behold him, and all the nations are going to begin to mourn. So this is, I believe, a correct assessment when we say this. Any attempt to separate these two descriptions of Christ's visible appearing into two separate events is unwarranted, unbiblical, and synthetic eschatological theory. And what we mean by that, it's not found in the Bible. It's just a false theory that we go and try to proof text from the Bible. The Bible does not teach a second and third coming or a phase coming with some kind of period between it. You can't find that anywhere. And people try to synthetically create that to say, well, he comes as, you know, he comes with his saints, uh, he comes for his saints the first time, and comes with his saints the next time. Well, the problem is with that is then the same passage, that rapture passage we read in verse 13, it says he comes with his saints for his saints in the same event. So there is no distinction between those two. That's a false, what we would call a fallacious, uh, you know, interpretation. Um, so it is synthetic. It is a, it's a way of dividing the scriptures that are not true to the scriptures. So what is more... Jesus places this rapture gathering event in Matthew 24 and all through his Olivet Discourse. He places it after, and this is the important part, after a time of great tribulation. He doesn't place it before the tribulation. If he did that, he'd have to place it at least in verse 14 of 
the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Because in verse 15, you get the abomination of desolation, which is 42 months into the last seven years. But it's not there because he goes on to talk about the church as if we're still observing these things. And here's what he says in verse 21. When you get down to verse 21, he says, For then, again, you get this word tata. I didn't put in it there, but it's there. Then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. In other words, there's never been a time this bad, and there's never going to be another time allowed to get this bad ever again. So this is obviously what the Bible calls the tribulation, the great one. So he's talking about the beginning after that abomination of desolation of the Antichrist rule, and it's only 42 months long. He doesn't get to rule for a long time. He's got 42 months, and that's it, and he's finished. And then he says this, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Do you realize in our day now, we know that we have the power as human beings to literally blast ourselves off the surface of this planet. With the atomic age, if all the nuclear bombs were released at one time, no one would survive. No one. Now, previous generations may have scratched their head and gone, well, how would that happen? You know, I guess it'd be a long, prolonged war, and finally the last guy kills the last guy or something, you know. No, we know we can push a, some buttons, and it would everybody would be obliterated. But Jesus says, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let it happen. He says, those days are going to be shortened. For whose sake? Your sake. The sake of the elect. He's not going to let it go that far. And he says, immediately after, another time sequence phrase, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the meteors of the heaven plummet to the earth, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then he goes, Tata, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. So now we know where this happens, after the tribulation of those days. As we turn to our study, we notice how it matches all the key details that Jesus is giving here and that Paul gives in a sense, especially in this passage that Jesus talks about in Revelation 6, 12 through 17, where Jesus opens this sixth seal. I'm not going to read the passage again, but let me just give you a few highlights. It says there's going to be a great, powerful earthquake. Remember, Jesus mentioned earthquakes early on in the Olivet Discourse. There will be earthquakes in many places. And then it says the sun turns black, and that's mentioned again in the Olivet Discourse. The moon turns as red as blood. The meteors of the heaven fall to the earth. Some of your translations say stars, same thing, and, and so on. The description is the same. And so we know that this event, that is the sixth seal, we can now place it in the sequence. It happens after the tribulation of those days, and it's in somewhere in there right where God says he shortens the time for the sake of the elect. That's all we know. Now, there, there's more to the passage, obviously. I'm not going to read through it all, but the skies receive as a scroll. The mountains are moved out of their place. But then we get this extra information. It talks about all the peoples of the earth, whether they be kings or princes or important people. In other words, generals are rich or mighty, whether they're slave or a free person. It doesn't matter. It says they all, all hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And what did they do? They cried for the mountains to, and the rocks to fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to withstand it? Now notice something. The number of people that are listed here in the categories would include every human being on the planet. So guess what? You're not on the planet. Not at this point. Why? Because it says everybody that's on the planet is going to be in terror, seeing him coming on the clouds of the sky, and they're going to be looking for caves and tunnels to hide in and calling for the mountains to fall on them. Is that what you're going to be doing? Not if you're a believer in Christ. The first thing you're going to do is go, hallelujah, you're going to get transformed and get raptured, and you're going to be off the planet, and God is going to be dealing with those who have rejected him and neglected him. There's a big difference, and you need to make sure that you're with the group that's going up, not the ones who are going down. 
because there is going to be a great division on that day. So let me finish by comparing some Old Testament scriptures real quickly. This section of Revelation uh, agrees seamlessly with the prophet Isaiah, for example, who prophesied that the day of Yahweh is coming, which is a description of the same day that we see in the sixth seal. So, for example, in Isaiah 13, 9 through 10, for, for see, the day of Yahweh is coming, the terrible day of his fury and fierce anger, destroying the earth and annihilating its sinners. Indeed, the stars of the sky and their constellations no longer give out their light. The sun is darkened as soon as it rises, and the moon does not shine. Sounds very familiar to everything we've been reading, doesn't it? Joel adds this, The sunlight will be turned to darkness, and the moon to the color of blood before the day of Yahweh comes, that great and terrible day. And all of this agrees clearly with what we've been reading when Jesus says immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. Meteors will fall from the heaven, plummeting to the earth, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, which means the demonic forces and the evil spiritual powers. So again, this Greek word astar refers to luminous bodies, so it it likely refers, as all the scholars say, to meteors and asteroids and comets and so on. So here's the thing. This is a cosmic event. Is anybody going to miss it? No. You're going to see it. I'm going to see it. Our God is not a local deity. And you need to understand that, and I need to remember that. We all do. Our God is no mere local deity. He is the great creator and sustainer of all that has come to exist. So let's look closely as we turn the final corner and look at this sixth seal. Let's look at a couple of things that it makes clear to us about what happens between the fifth and sixth seal. Remember the fifth seal, we see the martyrs under the altar. And then we saw in chapter 7 that there was a great group of martyrs who had come out of the tribulation that no one could number. That also seems to indicate a rapture of the church, because it's likely the whole church, but many of them, have, but they've come out of the tribulation. Now, some of them may have been martyrs, most likely a lot of them, because that's what was referred to in the sixth chapter, until the rest of those are martyred, that are to be martyred like you were when he talks to those under the altar. But maybe many of them were just transformed and raptured. But the point is, is that we see that uh, this great day of judgment comes and uh, the rapture happens somewhere before Christ appears in the sky with wrath. And so we come to the Lamb on the throne. And while the great judgment day is not here in view, that will happen a thousand years later when Satan is released shortly and then God destroys him and his army and then destroys the universe and begins to set up the new heaven and earth the great white throne judgment happens at the end of chapter 20 of Revelation. And so, even though this is not the great day of judgment, this is the beginning of God's judgments on those who refuse to repent. Now, this is where maybe your concept of Christ needs to be expanded to a more biblical view. And what I mean by this is we no normally only take note that Christ is the Savior, the Lamb who died for us, who defeated death, hell, and the grave for us. He's the one who loves us, and yes, that's all true, and it's perfectly true. That's the first truth you must know about Jesus. But for those who reject what he did for them, he eventually becomes the Lamb with wrath. He comes with justice. In fact, as we'll see in Revelation 19, he makes war with justice— Men have never made war completely just. There's atrocities that happen even in the so-called best of wars. But when Christ makes war, it will be absolutely and perfectly just. So he makes war with justice. And what, why is he doing that? Because he's tried to offer grace. He's tried to offer mercy. They've turned their back on it and said, no, thank you. And so at some point he says, well, you're not going to be able to be parasites on my universe forever evil doesn't get to run roughshod over my creation forever. The answer is, I'm dealing with it. Time's up. And he comes with wrath. 
So you need to understand that about your Messiah. He is also a God who will bring, bring wrath. So you can see that by taking note that the Lamb is the one who is opening the seals. He's the one sending the judgments. This means that we need to expand our understanding. So, yes, let's, let's not forget that his, the first time he came, what did he come as? He came as the Savior. He made it very clear he didn't come to judge anybody, right? So he comes the first time as Messiah the Lamb. And notice what he said about that. He said in John three seventeen through 18, he's talking to Nicodemus, by the way. He said, for God did not send his son into the world uh, to condemn the world. That's not what he came for the first time. But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And notice that the condemnation that results here is not a result of Jesus judging them, but of them actually incurring self-condemnation. He's saying, this is a condemnation they already had. I came to remove it. They rejected it and wouldn't believe in me and, and, and take my provision, so they remain in condemnation. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about that kind of condemnation. We were all born as sinners deserving hell. We were all born as sinners who are not fit for heaven. But Jesus came to change that. He came to redeem us, to forgive us, to transform us, and to make us new creations that can live with him forever. But if you reject that, then you have no other option than to accept his judgment of justice on you, because that's what will be coming. But the first time he came to remove this condemnation, Paul talks about this self-condemnation uh, several times when he uh, is writing in his epistles. One of those times is when he's writing to Titus, who's a pastor of a church, and uh, he's, he writes to Titus and referring to a member of a local fellowship that is being divisive and needs correction by the pastor, which in this case is Titus. And uh, Paul tells him how to respond to this person and how to deal with such a person if they won't repent. In fact, here's what he said in Titus 3, 10 to 11, and he gives us an insight about self-condemnation. He says this, warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them you may be sure that such a person is warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. In other words, God isn't condemning them. They're already self-condemned. God is just going to recognize that condemnation because they're refusing to come under God's corrective authority through his church. And that is a common sin in our culture today. Often when people are confronted with sin, either through preaching or through some pastoral staff person, confronting them that they need to repent of something, they just stiffen their neck and they say, well, I'm out of here. I'll just go to a different church. And that seems par for the course in our culture today. But the early church considered that to be a very grievous sin. One of the last things Jesus prayed for before he went to the cross in John 17 was what? He prayed that his church would be made one, that they would divinely love each other, that they would allow love, as Peter would say, to cover a multitude of sins, and that they, the world would know that we were his disciples because of the way we love each other. In other words, and he said, Father, bring them to absolute unity, that the world may know that you have loved them and that you have loved me and that you love the world. So Jesus is praying for this unity to be one of the most powerful evidences of Christ and who he is, because people don't normally live in that kind of unity. And when we do, we are showing that we have the power of the Holy Spirit among us. Because I got news for you. None of us are good enough to live in that kind of unity without the power of the Spirit. We've got to have it. But it's very important for us to also recognize that this is considered one of the most grievous sins. And this is why the Apostle Paul, well, Peter talks about how we're to live in love. And he says this, he says, above all, which means make this the first in importance, divinely love each other because deeply because divine love covers over a multitude of sins. 
And Paul, in a corrective letter to the Corinthian church that was dividing itself over all kinds of things. You know, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. I, you know, and they were just dividing the church up. And there was all kinds of division going on. And Paul rebukes him for three chapters, the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians. And then he finally says to them, you know, he basically saying, stop it. The body of Christ is too precious for you to divide it up like this. And then he warns them toward the end of that passage as he says this, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. You realize the temple is not this worship center. The temple is the person sitting next to you, and you join together in the person of Jesus Christ by his love and by his truth. That's what makes the temple of the living God. So I want you to do a little exercise as we conclude this message this morning. I want you to look at somebody around you. Go, go ahead, look. And smile when you do it, okay? And I want you to say to yourself, this person is a part of God's sacred temple. This person is holy. You don't have to say it out loud if you want to. That's fine. But this person is part of God's sacred temple. This person is holy. I should treat them with dignity. I should treat them with love. I should be in unity with them as far as I can be. Because as Paul said, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all mankind. And so that's what God is calling us to. And it's a grievous sin to divide the body of Christ. And Jesus warned us that when the time of persecution and deception comes, there will be divisions in the church. And what will be the result of that? It says that those who fall away from the faith will betray and hate each other. There will be division and sedition because those who fall away feel guilty. And so they start persecuting those who make them feel guilty. So I'm just going to give you this quickly. Your Messiah is not only a Savior, though. He comes as the lion warrior. You do realize that. We saw that in the, in the fifth chapter, didn't we? That he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. I won't read the whole passage, but you know it. Don't weep. He's overcome. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's the one who begins undoing these seals, and he sends these plagues to deal with evil and to end its parasitic parasitic. Uh, presence on the earth. And so Jesus is the lion. He is the great powerful one. And so clearly the, we can see that he is going to come to bring his people. And I, as I pointed out this sixth seal, the rapture has already taken place because everyone who's left on the earth is in terror. But we're not in terror. We're celebrating. And then finally, Let's finish by just reading Revelation 19, which describes this event again in Revelation, and we'll just finish with this. This is what John saw toward the very end as he sees the sixth seal once again with more information given to us. So the rapture of the church has taken place between the fifth and the sixth seal, and here's what he says. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, with justice, notice that word, with justice, he judges and makes war. Notice he's the judge. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. That refers to his deity. God is so comprehensive, nobody can know God fully but God. He's infinite, and only an infinite person can comprehend an infinite person. So he, he alone is the only one who knows his full name because the name stands for who you are. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God, another one of Jesus' names. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. That means with his words, he only needs to speak, and he can strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. That's the thousand-year reign. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. So he's coming with wrath from God. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You realize your Savior is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? 
There's nobody above him. There's no one ever going to eclipse him. And so he finishes it this way. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather your together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals and mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his name. Don't you ever take that mark, no matter what it costs you, because then you would be doomed. And then it says here, the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged himself with their flesh. Let me just simply say that um, Messiah is the king and the judge, isn't he? And folks, that probably isn't a passage that you would read in your devotions to encourage yourself some morning, because it's pretty... It's a pretty scary passage, isn't it? But this is what you should understand. Please get yourself in context. You're not going to experience this. You're going to be with Christ. You're going to be observing this, and you're going to understand it because you're going to realize they had their opportunity. He did everything. They had to push their way past the bleeding wounds of Christ. And they had to thumb their nose at Christ and say, I don't care what you did for me. I'm going my own way. And he will have no choice but to say the time for evil to be destroyed has come. You've made your choice. When evil is destroyed, you will be destroyed along with it. So the question this morning is, which side are you on? Every one of us are going to see this. This is not something that is obscure. It's going to happen. I think it's going to happen very soon. And as I'm looking more and more at these calendars I talked to you about that we have been able to reconstruct from the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on, and some of the scholars are updating some of the starting points of those calendars, I think the time is getting very short. But that means we just rejoice, right? Because our King is coming. Amen. We're, not a, we're looking forward to that because that day when He comes... Is going to change everything forever. And from that point on, we're going to live in God's new heaven and earth. And we are going to be his children who dwell with him forever. If you're not ready to meet him this morning, can I challenge you? Please think seriously about your eternal soul. Don't sell your soul, your very self, for cheap pleasures and momentary pleasures. There are people who are selling their souls for cheap momentary fulfillment. They're selling their very self for a small bowl of soup like Esau did. Don't do it because this day is coming and he wants you to be with him. Because he loves you, he died for you, and he wants you to be one of his forever children. Let's pray. Father, I pray that if there's any here this morning who need to receive you as Lord and Savior right now, help them right now to open their heart to you and say, Come, Lord Jesus, please come and help me, Lord, to recognize that I am a sinner who needs a Savior, and you are that Savior, and I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I invite you in and may your Holy Spirit regenerate me, destroy my old life and give me a brand new resurrected life that I can live to please you as a child of God. And I give myself away to you. Be my Lord, be my master, be my savior. And on that day, I will rejoice when you split the eastern skies and come with all your holy ones and I will rise to meet you and to know joy forever in your presence. I pray, Father, that you will help anyone this morning who needs to make that decision to do so. 
In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen and amen.